first of all, let me let, tell you that nuclear power and nuclear energy has served Ontario very, very well for the last 40 years. A little bit of history as to why Ontario is in the nuclear business I think is important to this uh, debate. Um, Ontario Hydro in the 40s and 50s had exploited all of its cheap water power and everybody agrees that water power is, is, a, is the most convenient and benign way of generating electricity. It then turned to uh, coal uh, to uh, make up uh, the power required by its growing industry. And sometime in the 50s, uh, there was a rail strike that limited uh, Ontario's ability to import coal from Pennsylvania. And the province was faced with a potential blackout due to inability to fuel uh, its coal-fired plants. Around the same time, uh, scientists at Chalk River, Ontario, were developing technology to harness <coughs> nuclear energy in a peaceful application. The application that was being developed at Chalk River was based upon using natural uranium and heavy water. So Ontario then had an opportunity to deploy this homegrown technology using heavy water and natural uranium to build uh, CANDU reactors in Ontario and give it an energy independence and security that it did not heretofore have. So that was a fundamental issue in the decisions taken around that time by Ontario Hydro to initially build the Pickering Nuclear Power Plant, which was commissioned uh, in 1971, followed by another, uh, uh, other units at Bruce and Darlington, to the point where we now have 20 Kandu, well, 18 Kandu units currently operating in Ontario. At one point, we had, uh, we had 20. Um, so, I, my argument is that nuclear is a very safe, reliable, and proven form of base load generation. Base load means it is there 24 hours a day, 7 days a week when you need it, which is distinct from some of the other forms of generation that do form an important part of our energy mix. For example, in, uh, in 2010, uh, there were 400 nuclear units operating worldwide. Uh, nuclear power plants produce 80% of the electricity in France. They produce around 20% of the total electricity uh, consumed in the USA. In, in Ontario has derived around half of its electricity from nuclear energy since, uh, since the early 90s when, when Darlington uh, came online. In addition to the 400 plants that currently operate around the world, there are 60 plants under construction and an under, another 65 in the planning phase, particularly in countries in, in Asia which have a rapid need to meet their growing power demand and thankfully are turning to nuclear for base load generation uh, in addition to the coal units. I understand that in China they're building one coal unit a week. That really scares me. So I'm glad that the Chinese uh, and the Indians are beginning to see nuclear as a greenhouse gas free way of, of producing electricity. So the CANDU unit, which grew up here in Ontario, which we have succeeded uh, with building the 20 units in Ontario plus another 15 units around the world, uh, has accumulated 600 reactor years of operation. That means each reactor, if you had uh, 600 reactors operating for one year or one reactor operating for six years, it's a measure of how much experience we have. During that period of time, there has not been any incident that has caused any harm to the public. Ontario values its clean air and so our industry applauds the decision by the Ontario government to close down all coal units. And the plan is that all coal units will be shut down by uh, 2014. In order to accommodate uh, the closing of, uh, of the coal units, Ontario must look for additional base load generation. Now in 2010, uh, our total uh, energy production from elect through electricity was based on hydro, about 23%, uh, coal, 12%, and that's going to drop to zero by 2014. Gas plants produce 6% of the total energy. Uh, wind uh, is around 1%, uh, and nuclear at about 50%. So that's our current um, uh, energy mix. If we were to replace and shut down all the nuclear units, 
and replace it with another reliable form of base load generation based upon fossil plants, we would be producing another 70 to 90 million tons a year of carbon dioxide. I think that's more than our planet uh, should bear, and, and I think we need to show leadership in this province so that other jurisdictions follow our lead in recognizing the importance of limiting greenhouse gas production. Nuclear power uh, is uh, an industry which is very strictly regulated by the Canadian Nuclear uh, Safety Commission. They regulate how plants are designed, uh, how equipment is manufactured to the highest quality standards, and they regulate the operators to ensure that operators are well trained and uh, have the experience and the skills needed to safely operate those plants. We are proud uh, that here in Ontario we have two world-class operators of nuclear power plants. Ontario Power Generation, which is the provincially owned utility, uh, operates 10 nuclear power plants at Pickering and Darlington, uh, and their safety record and performance record is extremely high. Uh, Bruce Power, which bought its, leases its units from, uh, from the old Ontario Hydro, operates the units of Bruce. Uh, six units currently operate uh, in the Virgin. Both of those utilities uh, have an extremely dedicated, well-trained staff of professionals. I would encourage you to talk to the people who live in those communities, because the strongest supporters of nuclear power are those people who live in the communities around Kincardine, around Clarington, who know people who work in those nuclear power plants, meet them at barbecues, understand their professional commitment to the industry. Result, we have strong. In fact, there was a competition recently as to which community would host the next nuclear power plant in the province, and uh, Darlington succeeded in doing that. As a result, um, Ontario Power Generation filed uh, its environmental assessment application to construct additional nuclear units at the Darlington site. Uh, ironically, those uh, here in public hearings started uh, uh, a week after the Fukushima event. Uh, but uh, in spite uh, some efforts by some people to stop the proceedings, the, the hearing continued. Uh, the report uh, was uh, recently filed uh, to the Federal Minister of the Environment, and the report concludes that there would be no negative environmental impacts from building additional uh, nuclear power plants uh, at the Darlington site. The next phase would be for the Federal Minister of the Environment to, having reviewed the report, make a decision to allow the, uh, the project to proceed, and that could happen uh, late this year or early next year. Now, I know Fukushima is going to be on your mind, so I'm going to address the issue. It did cause a major rethink on nuclear power in, in uh, many parts of the world, including here in Ontario. Um, as you may know, uh, Germany has decided to uh, shut down, immediately shut down some of its older plants, uh, and has now plans to, uh, to, to uh, terminate nuclear production in the future. Japan has also uh, shut down some plants. But most countries in the world recognize Fukushima as an event from which we must learn, the industry must learn, and from which the industry will be stronger. Um, the, main, the main lessons learned from Fukushima haven't been fully digested, but uh, the industry recognizes uh, a need for very thorough and careful emergency response planning. Uh, it recognizes that it must now deal with an event called complete station blackout. And that's what happened at Fukushima. The earthquake did not cause the problem, but when the tsunami entered the plant, it stopped all power to the plant. Now, um, Kandu is uniquely robust in its ability to cope with an event like that. And that's based upon the fact that Kandu has, on a relative basis, more water and less nuclear fuel. Uh, its nuclear fuel is not enriched. And, uh, and therefore is more easily cooled in the event of, uh, of an incident. Um, calculations have been done that shows that a Kandu nuclear power plant could survive three to four days without any on-site power. So an event like that, which is hard to imagine at Darlington because we're in a low earthquake zone and a tsunami is virtually impossible, but the event of all external power and emergency power on site being cut off uh, 
would cause uh, a station blackout, it's called, and then the utility would have three to four days to bring in fire trucks to uh, provide water. So um, let me summarize my points. The nuclear has proven to be a safe, reliable, cost-effective, and environmentally clean form of generation that's there when you need it 24 uh, by 7. We have great homegrown technology backed by strong utilities and a strong industry, which is what I represent, that manufactures parts and components uh, here in the province. We agree that energy diversity, as in the way you manage your own financial portfolio, is important. And therefore, I urge you to believe and, and uh, approve the motion that nuclear has an important First and foremost, I would say that nuclear has served, has served Ontario well for a time. There was a context under which we made decisions that we needed to make as a province. We faced gross unknown futures, nuclear saw some resolutions to some of those futures. And the same thing is happening very much now. Nuclear represents a whole generation and a whole ideology and a whole experience that largely has passed. And we face a whole new reality today that we did not face then. There's a number of things that I could specifically challenge that I hope to have time to. I may not get into all of them, but for example, is nuclear greenhouse gas free? That's a question that should be addressed. Is it environmentally benign? Well, the waste certainly isn't. We all know that. Is the process of excavating uranium? Is the process of enriching anything, which isn't always relevant, but sometimes is, are any of these processes environmentally benign? They're valid questions, and they're not immediately or simply resolved, um, which in, in and of itself is another concern. So today, I'm here to argue that nuclear is simply not a necessary component of Ontario's green energy future. I want to start by saying that a lot of these other concerns ultimately are secondary. Is it cost effective? Does it have an environmental impact? Does it anything? There's yeses and noes to all those questions, but first and foremost, do we even need it? There is a discussion around baseload. I want to propose right away that different countries have different understandings of baseload. And if you allow yourself different understandings of base load, then you allow yourself a different understanding of the need for nuclear. In Ontario, we have base load defined by nuclear, and we've defined it so cleanly and so well that we've come to the problem where now when we conserve energy, we actually had three where we paid others to use our base load because we dipped below the base that we can't turn off. You can't simply turn off a nuclear plant. So we have some issues with base load. Other countries have chosen to simply redefine base load as the variable load. It's wind and it's water. What does that do? Well, it gives you a very different grid system to start with, and it means you do have to do a lot more um, different looking planning. But there are ways that we can do this. So if you start with a variable base load, like wind and solar, and you use dispatchable load, like coal, like natural gas, like hydro, guess where the debate starts? There's lots of debate there. But if you can turn those things off and on quickly, then you can make sure you have exactly the amount of energy you need. Norway has done this with tremendous success, because they have huge hydro resources, and they have great wind up the fjords. So when they have wind, they store their hydro. When they don't have wind, they use their hydro. If they have lots of both, they sell their hydro and they make a killing off their European neighbors doing it. Much like what Quebec is considering doing with us, because it works, and they've seen it and they know it. We have all the same resources in Ontario, we can very easily do the same thing over time. Much like nuclear was built over time. It takes 10 years to build a new nuclear plant. That's plenty of time to build a whole lot of wind, solar, biogas, hydro, and other resources. What does this mean? It means it warrants some study, and it warrants some math, and it warrants some cost allocations. If we take a look at the costs, because really all of these discussions boil down to money, how quickly can we pay for it, and therefore how quickly can we do it? We still owe $15 billion on the nuclear plants we are now decommissioning. That's a real number, and we need to address that number. The political parties scramble about how to address that number. We've got some very different looking opinions right now on how that should be resolved. And it's a deep concern that the number even exists, let alone that it's for assets which we're now depreciating, declining, not using, replacing, getting rid of. It's a huge concern to me. If we measure out the actual costs today in constructing nuclear, it's double what it was five years ago. If we measure out the actual cost today in constructing nuclear that we can't turn on for 10 years, well, in 10 years from now, we can show with conclusive research that solar PV costs less than nuclear in 10 years from now. When we're buying real kilowatt hours on the real grid, solar is cheaper in 10 years from now. That's interesting. Wind is cheaper today. Wind will be much cheaper 10 years from now. Jim Harris is another speaker that's very popular on these topics and floats around Toronto. He likes to quote Wayne Gretzky. In hockey, you don't want to be where the puck is, you want to be where the puck is going. 
we are where the puck is. We are at nuclear. The puck is going very clearly to wind and solar and hydro and biogas and biomed. These are different technologies than we have in abundance today, but they are the only ones that will be cost affordable in five years from now, especially in 10 years from now, especially, especially in 20 years from now. So we have opportunities and we have options. We can invest great deals of money in limited, finite resources. Uranium is depleting globally and it will run out someday. There's an argument about wind, but it will. We're not going to run out of sun. We're not going to run out of wind. There's argument about wind being intermittent, about sun being intermittent. These things are true. Intermittent and unreliable are not the same thing. There are grounded arguments to suggest that nuclear actually is not terribly reliable. Right now, many of the estimates that our government has given when they do cost cal calculations on how much are we going to spend for a nuclear plant are based on the yield that you would get out of that plant. It's going to be turned on and running well 82% of the time. That's the number we use. Darlington was 64. We have 47 as a percentage out of one of the other plants. I can't remember if it's Pickering or, or which one it was now, but we have issues with that 82% number. It is not our experience in Ontario, certainly not in the last four years. When we talk about safety, everybody knows about Fukushima, Chernobyl, and Three Mile Island. Those are the yucky ones. Chalk River was yucky, but it wasn't nearly that yucky. Thank God for that. There's a quote out of the ex-Japanese Prime Minister that I'm going to read to you if you don't mind. Keep in mind this is Japan's context, it is not unilaterally applicable to the rest of the world. But here what he has to say, if the evacuation zone around Fukushima had expanded to 100, 200, or 300 kilometers, it would have included the whole Kanto region. What does that mean? That would have forced 30 million people to evacuate, compromising the very existence of the Japanese nation. That's the biggest reason why I changed my views on nuclear. If there are risks of accidents, if there are risks that could make half the landmass of our country uninhabitable, we cannot afford to take such risks, even if we're only going to have to be playing with those risks once in a century. That's nuclear's history. More than once in a century already. It's a hard thing to try to forecast. One of the inherent challenges with the technologies we depend on in Ontario today is their energy density. Once upon a time, Ontario was 100% water powered. We are the only place in the world that calls electricity water. You pay your hydro bill to a hydro company, that's water. We're the only place in the world that calls electricity water. Why? Because we used to only get our electricity from water. We were 100% renewable. We can do that again. But there was an intervening time where we needed something else. So we have nuclear. We've never been able to afford nuclear, never. When we started paying six cents a kilowatt hour, guess which politician wanted to raise the price in order to afford nuclear? Well, they didn't. They created a different tax subsidy to be able to afford nuclear. So we've always had subsidized, uh, subsidized electricity. Today, the subsidies are getting very creative, so we have to come up with things like feed-in tariffs and green energy acts to be able to come up with a different subsidy so we can now consider different technologies. If you put a feed-in tariff on nuclear, it would be at least a 37 cent feed-in tariff. You get a 20-year contract in some technologies, you might need a 50-year contract in nuclear to be able to pay for the electricity over time. You pay zero up front, you pay by the kilowatt hour. The nuclear industry does not work that way. There is not a privately owned nuclear plant in the world that did not have a sweetheart deal when it connected to the grid. Private people can't invest in open grid competing markets with nuclear. The sale of Atomic Energy Canada Limited was embarrassing over the last few years. The federal government gave it away for $15 million after a whole lot of negotiating because there are no private investors who are attracted to nuclear. You need a sweetheart deal to make it work. Why? Because I'm proposing to you it doesn't work. We can replace it with things that do. It did. It was important for a time, but it no longer does. It's much more expensive to build now and it will get more expensive yet. Wind, solar, water, biogas are getting cheaper quickly. By 2020, they will be cheaper by far. So we have a different scenario than we did once upon a time. Is nuclear safe? Well, Japan doesn't think so. Russia doesn't think so. China doesn't think so. Germany doesn't think so. Can it be safe? Probably. Probably. But we can never say yes. And how many people do we need to sacrifice before we can say yes? And what will happen 50 years from now when they discover a new thing they didn't consider? In my opinion, the energy density is not worth the trouble. Once upon a time we were 100% renewable. We changed from that for good reasons in the day. We've learned a whole lot since the 1998 ice storm, since the 2003 blackout, that energy density is not helping Ontario. It did once, but it's not anymore. We have problems with our grid that we should not have had if we had been able to stay, had been able to, we weren't able for a while, but if we had been able to stay distributed with little power generators all over the place, well guess what, we can do that again. And now that we're in the place where we are, it makes a lot of sense to create much more diversity in our grid, to create much more stability in our grid. And by the way, if you need to fix one, you don't have to turn off the whole city of Pickering to be able to fix it. And import new power from somewhere, well, you turn off the house that broke. 
you turn off the turbine that broke, turn off the biomass plant and fix it. This is a different equation than we once had. Can we replace everything presently on the grid today? Well, no, of course not. Can we replace it by the time we're going to decommission the things that we're going to decommission? Absolutely. We can do much more. We currently have, as of today, with the Green Energy Act, 15,000 megawatts. That's almost the whole supply of Ontario. 15,000 megawatts worth of applications. They will not generate 15,000 megawatts of power. You have to get into engineering to figure out how that works. You get somewhere between a quarter and a third of that at any given moment in the grid, which is enough to replace nuclear. If we start talking about exact kilowatt hours, we need to talk about conservation. I have a report over here from the Ontario Clean Energy Alliance, Clean Act, sorry, Clean Air Alliance, which goes into copious detail about conservation. It's their pet, <coughs> pet horse, Pembina Institute. There's another, a dozen other agencies that support and agree with this thinking. Today's nuclear fleet includes a certain number of plants and reactors that need to be replaced, decommissioned, recommissioned, re rebuilt, whatever. They're going to they're go over the next 10 years. In the same intervening period of time, if we keep going with the conservation programs we have, with just a little bit more investment, we could replace 47% of all of that with conservation and not need it at all. And then spend smart money on other things. Well, what does conservation cost? Some reports would suggest 5% of what new, new generation costs. Consistently, it's one-tenth to one-seventh of what new generation. Forget what type of new generation. It doesn't matter what type of new generation. Conservation is always, always cheaper. And if we spend some money promoting conservation <laughs> programs, we could avoid 47% of these very expensive projects. Well, how expensive are they? So far in Ontario, we have a 100% track record of going two and a half times over budget, two and a half times over schedule and changing budgets and schedules over time. It's kind of embarrassing. And we always have good reasons why the next project will be better, but we never had any evidence that it is. I think that the $38 billion that the Ontario Clean Air Alliance talks about on the one project is probably about the right number. And that's enough numbers in one pot that I could put solar on a whole lot of houses all over the province. Is that the right thing to do? No, but there's smarter things to do than that. But my point is, if we walk this out, one refurbishment at a time and say no, Let's free up that space on the grid. Let's put other things in its place. Let's let the private sector invest those 15,000 megawatts worth of projects they'd like to build. And let's spend public money on public things. The public doesn't need to own Bruce Nuclear. They privatized that already. Maybe the public shouldn't own any other nuclear plants either. But the public should own a grid. So let's build a grid linked through the north, just like the big CP Rail project once upon a time. And there's 30 gigawatts worth of electricity up there that the private sector would love to have access to. And Toronto would love to use it. We have different options than we had once upon a time, and that doesn't cost $130 billion. The Liberal Long-Term Energy Plan is $130 billion. That is four times what we spent last nuclear round. So my point is, we can't afford it. It's not as safe as we think, even if the problem only happens once every 100 years. It's not as clean as anyone says, and if we deal with the nuclear waste issue alone, that's the clean problem. If we deal with excavation and mining, that's another yucky mess. It's not as clean as everyone says. It had a time, it had a place. Today's place for nuclear is in a research lab, not out where it's affecting people. So that's my proposal, and I would suggest to you with strong confidence that 100% renewable was doable and is doable again in Ontario with what we already have and with the momentum we already have moving. Thank you very much. Uh, I did want to mention uh, nuclear waste. Uh, the total amount of used nuclear fuel that has been produced in Canada from the inception of the nuclear program up to, the, up to this date would fill a football field to the height of one, one player. So speaking of energy density, the waste problem is a relatively modest problem in terms of volume. Now I won't deny that it requires careful management and uh, Canada has developed a plan called the Adaptive Phase Management Plan to manage its nuclear waste and that, will, that plan was extensively discussed with members of the public uh, and the plan was approved in 2007 by the Federal Minister of uh, Natural Resources and it involves keeping the fuel at the nuclear sites for another 10 to 20, up to 30 years, then moving it to a centralized storage location and then ultimately uh, isolating it from uh, society in a deep geologic uh, repository. I think that's a more responsible way of dealing with waste than some of the other industries uh, that we uh, that we coexist with, such as the you know the coal plants and uh, and other industries. Um, in Ontario, we're, we're not blessed with with having 
huge amounts of undeveloped hydro. Derek cited the example of Norway, where you combine wind with hydro, and when the wind doesn't blow, you turn on hydro. Here in the province of Ontario, when the wind doesn't blow, and there are some very, very hot days in the middle of summer when there is no wind, and it's kind of hazy in the province of Ontario, and you don't have as much sun as you want, those are the days in which the gas plants have to be fired up. So that the, uh, the Clean Air Alliance that advocates against nuclear power, if you were to look into it, they're funded largely by the gas industry. The gas industry will benefit a lot from larger deployment of, of renewables such as wind here in the province of Ontario. The Darlington debt and the $15 billion, the story, and it's not something that our industry is proud of, but at the time that Darlington was uh, constructed, we were facing interest rates that went as high as uh, 15 or 18 percent. And at the same time, the provincial government put Darlington through a period where it was started and then slowed down and then started again. So the debt was largely due to the fact that it was a political decision to slow the project down and it happened at a time of extremely high interest rates. Since then, Darlington is performing extremely well. Its annual average capacity factor is not 64 percent, Derek. The records show that it's uh, over 90 percent and in fact we've had a couple of units in Darlington that have been the best performing units in the world. So it's an extremely reliable power plant that allows us to produce a lot less carbon dioxide uh, uh, here in the province. A couple of very well-known environmentalists, James Lovelock uh, and the former leader of Greenpeace, who at one time were adamantly opposed to nuclear with the same sincere, passionate belief that uh, my young colleague here exhibits, have, on reflection, now recognized that nuclear does play an important part in an energy mix. Not necessarily uh, to the extent that it did in the past, but it must be part of a prudent energy plan. Countries like China and Russia are continuing with their nuclear program, contrary to what Derek said. The only countries that have uh, turned their back on nuclear, certainly Germany and Japan. Now, one should remember that the reason Japan was able to so rapidly recover from the Second World War and be a very successful economy was because of nuclear because Japan does not have indigenous resources. Nuclear helped Japan very rapidly become a successful nation. Derek mentioned that all plants in Ontario have been late and over budget. Uh, another uh, fallacy. Darlington, yes, was an unfortunate project, but the plants at Pickering and Bruce were on time and on budget, uh, and those plants are largely paid for and are now making valuable contributions to uh, the province. The record of our company, uh, Can Do Energy, the new ACL called Can Do Energy, was very successful. Our two projects in China were on time and on budget. Whereas it was embarrassing, the sale of, I mean, I don't applaud the sale of, uh, of, of ACL and the way it was handled. But when Westinghouse, another major nuclear company, was put up for sale uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, the bids by a Japanese company, Toshiba, far exceeded what the, the experts on Wall Street were projecting. So the private sector does have an interest in nuclear, and, and well-run nuclear power plants in the U.S. Uh, sell for a premium on the, uh, on the stock exchange. There's always too much to talk about, so I'll try to be concise as well. 64% was Pickering units 1 and 2, not Darlington. So my apologies, I had the wrong reference. Um, Bruce Power was 75. So point stands, they're not quite as clean as we think they are, nor as accurate as, they, as we think they are. I am leafing through my reports trying to figure out exactly where I got the reference to the on time and on budget, but one of the things that I have read is a schedule that showed over history how one project changed its deadlines multiple times for reasons, but the fact was that they changed. And I'm not going to say that happens every time, but it certainly happened more than once. There's probably more research to be done there. My point is I just don't trust it. It's happened enough. I don't see it as trustworthy. Um, there are enough nuances and discrepancies in this debate that it, it could go on for some time in ways that personally I find just suspicious. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like spending this much money on something that has to be defended so ardently. So I would say if it's that much cheaper to get out of dealing with waste, period, if it's that much cheaper to get out of dealing with high centralized grids, if it's that much cheaper to give something that really is completely clean forever and is always going to be going down in cost, 
why on earth would we not do that? It just seems like the only responsible thing to do. There's a valid point to be said that in the intervening time, we depend somewhat on gas. Why? Because it's dispatchable. So is coal, so is hydro, and we have Quebec and Manitoba full of hydro, so we don't need to have only Ontario's hydro in the plan, and shouldn't only have Ontario's hydro in the plan. We import coal from the U.S. today. We could replace that very conveniently with hydro from Canada. There are a hundred ways to skin this discussion. My point is, all of the most cost-effective ones depend completely on renewable energy. All of the most environmentally benign ones depend completely on renewable energy. All of the most socially equitable ones depend completely on renewable energy. All of the most disparate ones, geographically, that are inherently the most reliable, that don't face 1998 ice storms and 2003 blackouts, depend completely on distributed renewable energy. The only solutions that I find plausible long term depend completely on 100% distributed renewable energy, which we did for a long time, which we got away from, which we need to get back to, which many international groups are saying we need to get back to, which many international governments are saying we need to get back to. And although Russia isn't abandoning their nuclear program and China isn't abandoning their nuclear program, there's good reason to argue that they really can't because they're not in the position that we're in. But we're in a position much like Germany's where we could shut off all our nuclear plants when it comes time to refurbish them and have them replaced with their better supply. It is more cost effective and healthier to live with. Thank you very much.